tables. And um, when we speak of tables, this is where you're going to get, whether you like it or not, a little history lesson. All right? But um, when we speak of tables, what do we mean? What do I mean when I say a table? A layout with boxes. Little boxes inside of big boxes. Um, I, I'm not going to say you're wrong, but for reasons that we're going to get into in a history lesson, I want to define it a little more specifically. Rows and columns. And rows of columns of what? Of some sort of data. All right? Whereas we can determine what the data is by looking at the row and the column it is. So if there was a, if we had a table, um, think of like an Excel worksheet would be a, a table. Um, if we had, say, a table that had Cleveland West. All right, and we had the count for the month of the year. And so on. And the row would be something like average, average low. Uh, average precipitation. and so on. That would be a table of data. We can tell what the data means by where the row and the column intersect. All right? So for example, this set is the average low for month. All right? Um, so that's what we mean by a table. Columns and rows of data that express some data in that format, and we can tell what the data means by looking at the row and the column that's in. Now, you could probably almost anticipate this after our forms discussion, but there's implications for people that can't see, all right? Because we, as being able to see, we can instantly, even without thinking, look up to see the column, look across to see the row. But someone that can't see obviously can't do that. All right? So later on we're going to talk about the, the uh, accessibility implications of tables. Now, the reason I make a big deal about this and I talk about data and we're going to get a history lesson is back in the old days, prior to CSS being widely used and even widely supported by the browsers, people would do the layouts of their page using tables. So if you've done web design years ago, you, I would say you're, you're looking, I, I hesitate to say guilty, but uh, <laughs> you're looking like, yeah, I know what you mean. Back in the old days, people did that. Why? Well, they did it with, with pretty good reason. All right? It, it got the job done. It wasn't that hard. And browsers had fluky CSS support Plus, people hadn't really, you know, some, pe you know, some folks hadn't really learned CSS yet. So, because of that, you're able to do that. Now, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that it locks you into a certain format. So, for example, you could make a screen, and you could make the whole screen one giant table with two rows and two columns. And you could do something like put a picture here, put the banner here, put the navigation here, and have here the content area. The problem is, is that you're then locked into that two by two grid because a table is always going to be a table and it's always going to have rows and columns. All right? So if I wanted to do it like this, I'm out of luck because that table forces us into a two-by-two two grid. All right? So 
back in the old days, people did it because they did what they had to do to get the job done. Yeah, I would say it makes it sound like, you know, they're pioneers and, you know, and, and you know, they, they ate hedgehogs or something, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, they, but people did that because, again, lack of browser support and, frankly, lack of familiarity with CSS. Now, we can learn CSS. The browsers do a pretty good job supporting it, you know, for the most part. And we can use CSS and we can achieve the flexibility for this. This is a case, there, there's two things wrong with this. And, and maybe there's only one thing and there's two ways to say what's wrong with it. The one thing that's wrong with it is using a table for your page's layout ties the HTML to your page to the appearance of the page. Remember, way back since class one, we talked about HTML being the content of the page. CSS being the layout of the page and the physical look of the page. All right? If you put a table in your HTML, you're putting an aspect of the layout in your HTML. If you're not using it for data, that is. If you're using it to lay out your page. And that instantly decreases the flexibility of your page. Instantly makes it harder to maintain and so on. Maybe another way to say that is, and, and, and again, take this with a grain of salt, but you're lying to your browser. Don't lie to your browser. What do I mean by lying to your browser? I mean you're using a tag in a way other than it was intended. All right? A table tag is meant to represent a table of data. All right? If you use it for other purposes, again, that's where we get back to the first consequence. You're tying, the, you're tying the layout of the page into the HTML, making it hard to change one without changing the other. All right, so we're going to not use tables to achieve layout. There's other cases of not lying to your browser, by the way. You know, using an H2 where you should use an H1 because you want your H1s to be smaller. All right, yeah, do it with CSS. All right. Using a bunch of paragraphs instead of using a list because you don't want bullet points next to the items. No, nope. just go in and remove the bullet points via CSS. All these things are cases where you're using the tag in a different way and you're not giving proper information about your page to the browser. And you might say, well, what's the harm of that? You know. Um, is the browser going to have hurt feelings when it figures out eventually that we've been lying to it? Or is it no longer going to trust us? Or what's the problem with lying to your browser? The problem is you, you lose the flexibility. All right? Especially, and the table is a major example of that. Now, if I probably should have said this at the beginning, but if you didn't do web development a long time ago and you didn't use tables to achieve your layout, you could probably forget what I said for the past five minutes. All right? Because if you learned it the right way, then good for you. Keep on doing what you're doing, and so on. But on occasion, I do get students that will say, you know, well, you know, you know I've, I've done it this way in the past, and it worked and all that. And yeah, it, you can get it to work, and it is relatively simple to do. The problem is the cost. The cost is the flexibility. And remember, so many things we do in software development and web development relate to making it more maintainable. So losing the flexibility is a big, big deal. All right? So if we want to organize data into rows and columns, one thing that you should realize right off the bat is we can't do it simply by putting white space in. So let's go and let's start making a page. And let's do it incorrectly first. And then we'll come around to doing it correctly. So,
So I get this a lot from students like maybe the first week of classes when they're doing this. They might want to do a table and they might do something like this, you know. Well, I can just do this. January. I almost said January, March. Probably because February is always such a brutal month. March. And then I could do average high. I don't know, 21. February average high. Looks like what? Oh, yes, I have. Yeah, yes, I, I, I have seen it. I used to be really good at those problems. Yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I actually saw a New Yorker cartoon that said the real problem is why would anyone want to associate with a psychopath like Cheryl, you know? Wow. All right, I'm spending an awful lot of time to show you how to do it wrong. All right, I just realized that. All right, this isn't going to work. Why is this not going to work? I, it's not going to give me the nice table that I want. What's it going to give me instead? Yeah, it's going to give me just a long string of data. Why? Because HTML treats any collection of white space, any series of white space, as just one space. So if I go and save this, just looks like this. All right, and not effective. All right, now, on occasion I'll get someone to say, well, what if I put each row in a paragraph? And what if I use the non-breaking space tag to space it out? Well, you could probably cobble together something that would sort of work, but it would be very fragile. And by fragile I mean that anything changed, like you change, the user changes the font size, or you view it on a different kind of screen, or whatever, and it's just going to break. All right. So the answer isn't try to go against the grain and try to figure out a solution um, that doesn't involve tables, but to say, hey, this actually is a problem where the data is represented in a table. It's a table of data. It's rows and columns of data that are related. And we can tell what row and column go together um, to form a particular data cell. So there are four basic tags with tables, and then there's a handful of others that, um, that, that, we can, uh, that, that we'll use. And today, at the very least, I would like to cover the basic table tags. In addition to the basic table tags, there's like the extra table tags. Um, then there are styling tables, and then there are um, accessibility issues with tables. So over the next couple of classes or so, we'll cover all of those. All right. Basic table tags. There's four of them. Table, TR, TH, and TD. The table goes around the entire table. It says, here's the start of my table, here's the end of my table. Again, for one table, you're going to have one set of table tags, a start and an end tag. You don't have a table tag for each row or anything like that. So the table that I am trying to create here with the Cleveland weather um, would be um, just one table. T 
TRs represent table rows. So a table is a series of rows. All right. So in this case of this table that I'm trying to create, there are four rows. First row, second row, third row, fourth row. All right. There are also four columns. And columns are represented either by THs or TDs. TH represents table header. It's like the label associated with a column or a row, for that matter. TD represents table data. All right, table data. And that's the actual data of the table. All right, so let's go build this table. First of all, I'm going to make my table tag. And table. This is all in the body section, by the way. Remember, anything you see in the, 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 the window is in the body section. I still occasionally get students that will put something in the head section that belongs in the body section. So beware of that. One thing you can do is run through the validator to find out if there's any errors. And the validator will tell you right off the bat. All right. TR is our first table row. And that's going to comprise of headers. Try and think of a right word for that. We'll go with statistic. All right, so that's our row of headers. And I'm going to put in some rows of data, and I'll just make up numbers. <laughs> yeah. Average high. Um, let's see, average high in January, we'll say is 20. Not this January, but... Maybe some Januaries. All right. I'm going to go and clone this a couple of times. Notice how I'm indenting this. That is pretty critical because you can easily lose track of where things are if you don't have proper indentation of it. Remember, from the browser's perspective, this could all be just one giant line of code. But that would be a headache to, to go back and like change something or to add a column or to add a row or something like that. So therefore, we want to make sure that we go in and we have this lined up pretty well. I don't even know what average precipitation would average, so we'll give 22... 22, 23, or 33. All right, let's go and save this. And we look at it. Now we see it's organized in a table. Now, I made a mistake. Can anyone spot the mistake? I made them all headers. Really, yeah, the top one and probably the first column you could call a header as well. Because that's not actual data, that's explaining what the data is. 
So it should be, all these should be TDs. How did you know that that's what I did? It, because it was all bold, all right? Um, I, you know, the other acceptable answer was because I was actually paying attention and I watched what you were doing and I noticed that you typed in THs. Uh, but if you weren't, if you didn't notice every little detail, if that slipped past you like it slipped past me, you'll notice that the THs, THs by default are bold and centered. All right? Again, don't lie to your browser, though. Don't make something a TH simply because you want it to be bold and centered. We can make the THs be something else other than bold and centered if we want. And we can make TDs bold and centered if that's what we want. Use a tag that's appropriate and then use the CSS to make it look the way you want to. That sort of Another way of saying, don't lie to your browser. So, we go here, we save it, hit refresh, and you'll notice that the THs are bold and centered, the TDs are not bolded, and they're left aligned. All right? How did you decide how big to make the table? You can make a table as big as you want, how did it decide how big to make this table? Okay. Okay, that's true. Pardon me? Yeah, I guess that's more of what I'm getting at. Maybe maybe that's what you guys were, were trying to say and I just I just wasn't catching it. It makes it as big as it needs to be. So if we notice, each column is as wide as the widest piece of data in that. So statistic is that wide because average per uh, precipitation is this wide. The January column is this wide because January is that wide. Likewise February, likewise March. All right? So by default, it makes things as wide as they need to be. All right. It's not going to cut off data. It's going to make it as wide as you need it to be. Now, again, that's a default behavior. And that's good. For some tables, that might just be fine to, to, to style it that way. However, we more than likely want to put more control over this. And we can do that by applying CSS to this. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create some CSS for this. And I'm going to start by giving the table a size. All right? And we can give the table a size, just like we can give any element a size, any block element that is, by assigning it a width of either an absolute amount or a percentage. Or we can mix a percentage and a minimum width, which is, is um, a lot of times what I do in cases like this. So, I'm going to go back here. I'm going to put the style tag in. And I'm going to say table. I want to have a width of 70% and a minimum width of 300 pixels. All right, so if we look at this, it makes it that big, all right? Width of 70% of the page, the minimum width of 300 pixels. So if I resize this, it will get smaller and smaller up to a point. And there it stops. How did it decide to make, how did it decide the width for each column here? All right, because at 70%, I can easily fit in the widest content so, how does it figure out the widest, how does it figure out um, how wide to make each column here? 
we can probably see that March is still the narrowest column and this is still the narrowest or I'm sorry this is still the widest column I don't know exactly it does a proportional all right to the biggest text in the field so January and February are about even um, the statistic column is wide and the March column is narrow what could we do if we wanted to make all the columns have an even width. For what? Of what? Well, well, you you go like this. I, I can't I can't make that gesture in the CSS file. What what? Remember, with CSS, you have a selector and you have an attribute. The attribute you said is the width. All right. What's the selection? What's the selector? Put it on the th. Right. So I'm going to put on the th a width of twenty-five percent. Given that I have four columns, it should make these all equal width. So I look at that, and sure enough. That's what we get. It's a little hard to see. We could put a border around these things if we wanted to see them. All right. Let's put a border around the THs. That will help us see the width of the table. Border. And if we look, those look approximately even. What if I give the browser impossible instructions? What would be an example of an impossible inst instruction that I could give it? Well, I have four columns. What so if I said make each one of them 50%? All right can't do that, right? There's four columns, 50%. So, what does it do? It, it does the best that it can, <laughs> all right? Um, I would hesitate to say, I would hesitate to, to try to define exactly what it did, all right? No. That's not a table then, right? Because a table has to be a, a row going across. Alright. I was he I would hesitate to say how it decided to make those columns that wide, but it did. In other words, it took a shot. Alright? You gave it impossible instructions, it did the best it could. Alright? And that's what it come up with. So remember, the, the way something looks is always dependent on your CSS and the browser's behavior. So, I would think so. There might be in the HTML specifications a description or in the CSS uh, um, a description of what to do in this case, but I wouldn't count on it being consistent. Well, let's go just out of curiosity and put it in another browser. It looks pretty much the same. All right, let's put it back here. What if I give I won't say this is impossible, but I'm specifying four columns having a width of 20%. That doesn't define all of the width. What's it going to do? Well, it's going to take a shot again. And looking at this, it kind of looks like it made them all even.
notice that, again, it's not going to cut off data. So at this point, when you go down here, average precipitation doesn't fit going across. It, cut, it drops it down to two rows. Mm -hmm. What if I, uh, now, now notice that I just gave the style rule to a TH. I didn't need to give a style rule to every TH and TD, every, every column. So if you style one element in a column, that styles the entire column. All right, so that's pretty convenient. All right, what if I wanted to make one of the columns wider? All right, let's say I wanted to make, let's make sure this adds up to, to, to 100%. Let's say I wanted to make the first column um, 40% and the other three columns 20%. How could I do that? Give it an ID. All right, so I could say ID equals statistic. TH, I could give a, I could keep the width at 20%, and then for fat, I could give it a width of 40%. And that one's wider. Again, when it gets to the point where I can't really do that, it makes adjustments for it. What if I wanted the I'm going to hold that thought. Do you notice something? with the borders and the THs. There's a tiny little gap between them. All right? You can get rid of that by defining on the table border collapse, collapse. Yeah. And that will sort of make it look more like an Excel worksheet. All right. What if I the top row be a different color? CSS. How could I do that? Background. What would my selector be? If I only literally want the top row and I don't want that, if I put the TH border or uh, uh, background color, you're right, it would do it, but it would also do that first column. So that works, but it gave me these three, which I don't want. So what would I do instead? No. So where would I give an ID? What would I put the ID on? Could make it a class or an ID, depending on whether I thought there were other rows that I would want to do this for. So what would I put the ID on? First TR. And then I could do I think this is the case of me cutting and pasting took twice as long as if I would have just typed it in. But I'm lazy. And there we go. 
I'm going to add a bunch of rows. And I realize I'm going to be repeating stuff, but let's pretend it's actual other information. Now, one thing that was done back in the old days for computer printouts was they were printed, computer printouts were printed out on what were called green bar paper, with, uh, where, where, each, where there were alternating bars of very faint green and white. And what that helped the person do is keep in alignment as you read across the page. Because those printouts were wide, and as your eye was traveling across the page, if it was a solid white sheet of paper, your eye would have a tendency to like slide up or slide down a little bit. and You might get the wrong data associated with the row. So with the green bar, it sort of helped you. It, would be almost, it was almost like putting a ruler underneath it where your eye could follow across the straight edge. The only difference is it was actually following back um, the, the green bar on the paper. We have a similar possible situation with tables, especially if there's a lot of data in them. We're looking at this, our eye could go up or down. How could we give, an, how could we give a, sort of an alternating color, or, or a color to alternating rows? How could I make it, for example, um, so that all the rows, so, so that the even number or the odd number rows are gray and the even number rows are green. Pardon me? Ooh, that's, ooh, hold that thought. Hold that thought. This might be a case of me learning something today. All right. That's the CSS3 function that you're talking about that. I'll show you the old school way first, all right, and then we'll look at doing uh, that. So if I wanted to make these alternating colors, one way to do it was I could first of all give a color to the whole table. So I could say table. Background. Gray. That'll give me the whole table, that background. All right. I'll make it a little bit lighter so we can actually read it. There we go. And then I could define a class for alternating row. And I could go in and say that that is a background of pound sign BBFFBB. So it's going to be a very pale green. And then I can apply that to alternating rows. Now, a couple things about this. This could get a little tedious if you had a big table. Do keep in mind, however, if you had a big table, you might be generating this via server-side script, in which case it's not tedious at all. And I missed... Pardon me? Oh, there we go. All right. Now, what was the way that you uh, said to do it instead? Yes. Okay, let's let's look it up. Yeah, let's look it up. T R 
all CSS alternating rows. And you know what? This is stupid Internet Explorer, so it's not going to Google it for me. It's going to think it's a URL. Internet Explorer is not stupid. Internet Explorer is a piece of software. Softwares are not smart or stupid. Softwares. Did I say softwares? <laughs> I, uh, I, one, of the, one of my favorite Facebook uh, pages is The People of New York. Oh, I don't know yeah. if you've ever read that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, or Humans in New York, right. But uh, the one yesterday was they showed this older woman that said, some of my friends are members of the Internet, which I, which I thought was priceless. <laughs> Oh, is that the, the guy that did it? Okay, here is an example. Right, well, hey, hey, no, that's fine. The other way we could do it would be like this. This is, this is probably a better way. Because you just apply it one time, right? You know, it's funny. Um, this is, I think, what got me into software development. All right, this very fact. Is that software development, you're rewarded to some degree for being lazy. All right? In other words, if you can find a real easy way to do something that doesn't take you a lot of effort, in most jobs, they'll tell you you're being a slacker then, right? Whereas in programming, you're doing a great job. Right? Because the whole idea is to do things as quickly and efficiently, and so you, you can easily change it. And so in this case, if I go and do this, it should, ooh. Let's look at the example. Oh, you know what? <laughs> what browser am I using? Internet Explorer. This is an old version of Internet Explorer. There we go. All right, and in Chrome it does do that. So that's why it's good that I showed you the old school way, I guess depending on the browser. This raises a good point, though. All right, which way should I do it? Should I do it the way that works both in the old browsers and a new browser? Or should I be forward thinking and just use the CSS3 method that only works in a new browser? Uh, the thing was made is this the user's fault if they have a crappy browser. Um, I might put that a different way. All right, I would put it that your responsibility of a web developer is to make it workable across platforms. You do not have the responsibility to make it pixel perfect, where it looks identical across every web browser. So it would be acceptable to me to use the CSS3 method here, and people that have a newer, better browser are going to get a better browser experience. That only goes to figure, right? I mean, if, if I have you know, if I have an old AM radio compared to a brand new, you know, thousand dollar stereo system, I'm going to expect to hear better music through the stereo system than the old radio. Same idea with this, all right? With an older browser, you have to expect, you, or you can expect to have the top level experience. That being said, it should still be workable. That is your responsibility. So you got to make sure, again, as the statement goes, that there's graceful degradation, that um, that um, you know is workable in all different environments, um, and it doesn't just completely break down. So in this case, yeah, it's okay. They can still read the data, all right. It doesn't match the way that I wanted it to look, but it still looks reasonable. At any rate, for lab assignments, if you want to do the alternating row effect, you could do it either way. Either way would be acceptable, that you could do it with the class. 
and you could do it with the nth element CSS3. Yes. Yes, but. Yes, but. Let's try that. Let's find Excel. I'm pretty sure. I, I, that should be my actual answer. I'm pretty sure, but. Yeah. So, like, we'll go here and we'll put in, you know, January, February. March, average, high, exactly, exactly. It is going to give us a bunch of garbage in addition to the HTML. So if I go here and I have that, I should be able to go to File, Save As or Export. We'll try both of them. Save As. And if I go down here, I probably have HTML somewhere here. Web page. Try that. Some features may be lost. Yes, I do. <laughs> and now if we look. It actually creates a web page, an HTML document with all these related files. So if I open it with my browser, I get that. But it also generated this kind of garbage, extra CSS, and so on. Let's try export and see if that gets us any different results. Oh, was, we're back to the same dialogue. So the answer is kind of yes, but it's, it's likely more trouble than it's worth. All right, let's look at the HTML that it gives us. <laughs> he just asked the question. He didn't write the code. <laughs> I mean, we could maybe blame him for the Bob Marley, but we can't blame him for this. I mean, come on. All right. All right. So that's our intro to tables. Next time we'll look at some additional tags. We will look at additional styling. And we will look at accessibility issues with tables. All right, see you up in lab.